Good evening. From the Gail Lemron Auditorium on the campus of Embry-Riddle, welcome to the Embry-Riddle Speaker Series. I'm Mark Bernier, moderator for tonight's event. This is National Engineers Week, celebrated in countries around the world and in the United States with over 50 different corporations. It is a major event here on the campus of Embry-Riddle. I want to thank Dr. Maj Mermorani and Dr. Jeff Kane for their cooperation in producing this event that we get to showcase one of the nation's greatest science reporters and correspondents, Miles O'Brien. To introduce this event and our guest speaker tonight, it is my great privilege and pleasure to introduce to you once again Dr. Maj Mermorani, Professor of uh, Engineering, Mechanical Engineering, and the Dean of the College of Engineering here on the campus of Embry-Riddle, Dr. Mermorani. Every day, engineers in this country and around the world are busy finding solutions to some of the most challenging problems we face and creating technologies that make life better for all of us. From the conquest of a space to medical devices used to treat cancer patients to modern transportation systems to finding breakthrough technologies for harnessing clean water and clean energy in abundance, engineers have used their imaginations and skills to innovate, change our world, improve the quality of life, and shape the future of mankind. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University 2018 Engineers Week. Before introducing our guest speaker, I would like to acknowledge uh, a couple of people. Trustee Dr. Jay Adams and his wife, Leela, who are joining us tonight. As Mark said, I also would like to recognize my colleague and good friend, Dr. Jeffrey Kane, Professor of Humanities and Communication and Director of the Honors Program at Daytona Beach. Tonight's event is a partnership between Honors Program, Speaker Series, and the College of Engineering. Of all the amazing engineering and technological achievements of the current and the past century, None is more fascinating, inspiring, and captures the imagination like flight itself and human space exploration. It is therefore fitting to have this year's keynote address delivered by Miles O'Brien, the reporter whose name is the media, in the media is associated with science, aviation, and the space program. Miles O'Brien, is the science correspondent for PBS NewsHour, producer and director of the PBS science documentary series, NOVA, and a correspondent for the PBS documentary series, Frontline, and the National Science Foundation Science Nation series. For nearly 17 of his 32 years in the news business, he worked for CNN as the science, environment, and aerospace space correspondent and the anchor of various programs, including American Morning. While at CNN, he secured a deal with NASA to become the first journalist to fly on the space shuttle. The project ended early due to the loss of Columbia and her crew in 2003, a story he told the world in a critically acclaimed 16-hour marathon of live coverage. O'Brien is an accomplished pilot, is frequently called upon to explain the world of aviation to mass audiences. He has won numerous awards over the years, including a half dozen Emmy, and Peabody and DuPont for his coverage of Hurricane Katrina and its aftermath. In February of 2014, 
A heavy equipment case fell on his forearm while he was on assignment. He developed acute compartment syndrome, which necessitated emergency amputation of his left arm above the elbow. Born in Detroit and raised in Gross Point Farms, Michigan, he is based in Washington, D.C. He was a history major at Georgetown University. He has a son at the U.S. Naval Academy and a daughter at Davidson College in North Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Miles O'Brien to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University as our engineer's keynote speaker. What a nice introduction. Hi, everybody. It's great to be in Daytona. It is so nice to be here. I just flew in from Boston, and boy, is my arm tired. I'll tell you. <laughs> Tend to fly in circles. So um, maybe we can bring up the, uh, the, the, the keynote there. There we go. I just want to tell you I am quite happy to see you, uh, and we're so glad you came out tonight. I guess given the fact that it is a free speech, um, it would be all on me if this is an empty uh, auditorium. Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, aviation, science, technology, the media, news, fake news, and the fact that fake news may not be as new a phenomenon as we have been led to believe, perhaps. Let's talk a little bit about the first flight, December of 1903, Orville and Wilbur, uh, uh, the first powered flight, tremendous success. Do you know much about how the media covered that event? Uh, it was covered, um, really, certainly in 1903. You could make the case it was the story of the century, that early in the century. Uh, but basically, it made the front page in the Virginian Pilot and the Cincinnati Enquirer. That was it. New York Times didn't touch it. It was very scant coverage. Now, the Virginian Pilot story um, had some interesting little details in it, which you should know about. First of all, it was a three-mile flight at an altitude of 60 feet. Wrong. Um, there was a six-bladed underwheel propeller. The engine was suspended from the navigator's car. Huge fan-shaped rudder of canvas. And uh, Wilbur's first word, Eureka. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 1903, fake news. <laughs> So how did this go? How did something so right, if you will, go so horribly wrong? That's right with a W. Yes, you got that. Uh, the Wrights had a very flawed media plan, as it turns out. They um, did their best part to execute a specific way of shoveling out the story to their favored newspaper. It happened to be the Dayton Journal. So they sent a terse telegram home. Success, four flights Thursday morning, all against 21-mile wind. Started from level with engine power alone, average speed through the air, 31 miles an hour, longest 57 seconds. Home for Christmas, they said. Uh, the telegram was sent to their older brother, Lauren. His job was to uh, go down to the Associated Press office at the Dayton Journal and give them the story of the century. He walked in. Uh, that, that's a representation of what that looked like, but that's about right. And there, there, is a there was a gentleman there by the uh, name of Frank Tumlinson who uh, said some words which will go down in journalistic history. He said, 57 seconds, if it had been 57 minutes, then it might have been a news item. He missed the scoop of the century. So let's go back to that Virginia Pilot article. Uh, with all those things were wrong. How did that get all messed up? Well, when the Wrights arrived at Kitty Hawk uh, to send that telegram, uh, back in those days, uh, any reporter or uh, journalist worth his salt was uh, kept in close contact with the telegraph operator because all good stories would go through him. And uh, that was um, something that came up. They went to the telegraph operator, told, dictated this telegram, and he said, would you mind sharing this little tidbit with the Virginian pilot? And they were like, no, we're, sh we're sharing this with the Dayton Journal and the Dayton Journal only. Of course, the telegraph operator immediately called his buddy over the Virginian pilot, a guy by the name of Harry Moore. Now, Harry Moore at the time uh, was uh, a young man in the circulation department. There he is a lot later in life because <laughs> he had his own little bit of infamy as, a, as associated with this story. 
Uh, he was trying to move his way up in the journalistic ranks, <clears throat> and he took those details that uh, were in that telegram, not much, and obviously should have been a novelist, right? I mean, he had a great um, uh, flair for fiction. Years later, Harry Moore, uh, whose article there is in a plaque and everything, uh, would meet Orville, right? And Orville um, said to, to Harry, uh, it was an amazing piece of work, though 99% wrong, it did contain one fact, there had been a flight. <laughs> And Moore proceeded to write that Orville Wright had corroborated his story. <laughs> so another lesson from the Wrights and the disconnect with the media. 1908, Fort Myer, Virginia, right across from uh, D.C., near Arlington Cemetery, Orville Wright shows up and stages a series of uh, epic flights, really. Every time he got in the plane, he set a new record for endurance or something else. He was carrying passengers. The idea was to show this off to the army as a potential instrument of war. Uh, and none of this, day after day after day this is going on, none of this made front page news. Uh, the New York World ran a piece about, they were kind of worried about whether the crowds would get hurt by the aircraft. Uh, but there was nothing said about how momentous it was to have this craft flying around. And then on September 17th, uh, things changed. Um, and there it was. <clears throat> Uh, Orville had switched out propellers, it was a little longer, one of the propellers split, control cable went, and they went down. And Orville was nearly killed, he broke his femur and nearly died, and his passenger, Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge, became the first aviation fatality in a powered aircraft. This is the first smoldering hole in the ground. Uh, care to guess whether this story made the front page news? You know the answer, don't you? There's Selfridge. Front page, the New York Times, first plane crash, fatal fall of Wright airship. The pattern really hasn't changed since then. Um, and of course, rampant early speculation there, machine wreck increased like the blade. They actually had a few things right. Uh, but I, it leads me to a, a couple of important points that I want you to keep in mind as we continue this discussion. Um, smoldering holes are news. The demand for facts inversely, is inversely proportional to their availability. Think about that. You want the facts when they're least available. And in the 24-hour cable world, that can get ugly, right? Nature and news abhor vacuums. Reporters are scientific and technological nincompoops. Don't ever forget that. <laughs> A good story is hard to control. The rights tried to control that one. Mistake. And fake news predates Twitter and our commander-in-chief. So flash forward, let, I want to go a little out of, out of sequence here. Let's flash forward to a story that came in in uh, 2011. The, the date was, uh, it was in April of 2011. A little bit of breaking news came into Fox. A very close call involving a Boeing 737 jet carrying the first lady of the United States, Michelle Obama. As far as we know, nobody was hurt. No one, including the first lady, was said to be fine. She was on her way back to Washington after an appearance on The View yesterday in New York when her plane had to abort its landing. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, anybody knows a little bit about aviation, this was a go-round. These happen every day all over the place. Probably the most famous go-round I know of. Controllers at Andrews Air Force Base realized that her craft was within four miles of the, uh, the uh, aircraft that was ahead of them on final approach. They said, crew, break it off and go around. Big deal, right? Well, somehow that got lost in the coverage. Take a look at CNN that same day. We know that a 737 can cruise comfortably around 100 miles an hour. It'd be slower than that coming into land, but if you just do the math, Jessica, if this plane hits the runway, another plane is coming in around 500 miles an hour. That Do you hear that speed? <laughs> that that distance from the time this landed, if this is four miles or so, it's going to cover that distance in about a half a minute. So uh, the 500 mile an hour approach, that's what I call coming in hot, all right? <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's an interesting way to arrive at the airport. Uh, so the media, we're still nincompoops, okay? Uh, we're, um, you know, and, and not only that, we're interested in taking uh, reality and adding a little something extra, a little je ne sais quoi, a little something uh, to make uh, the fiction even better, I guess. Can, now, I, I want to show you the same day now, two stories. The first one is the same reporter probably different producers. Lisa Stark, uh, no, no longer at ABC, great reporter, but 
I want you to pay attention to how they handle the graphics. The first one comes from Good, Good, Morning, excuse me, Good Morning America. Let's watch that one first. At first, all was routine as controllers talked to the jet, codenamed Executive One Foxtrot. Also in the skies, a giant C-17 military cargo plane. Controllers at an approach facility near Washington, D.C. apparently allowed the planes to get too close. The required separation, five miles apart. But Mrs. Obama's plane flew just three miles behind the cargo plane. Okay, so obviously not to scale, but I'm gonna give them this one. This is not too bad as they go. Now, uh, the folks who are doing ABC World News Tonight were watching that graphic, no doubt that morning over their cornflakes, and decided this was a lousy graphic, because look what happens with the same reporter you know, eight hours later on World News Tonight. Also in the skies, a giant C-17 military cargo plane. <laughs> Controllers apparently allowed the planes to get too close. The required separation is five <laughs> <laughs> That's in-flight fueling there, I think. <laughs> I mean, as long as you're there, could you give us some gas? <laughs> Remember what I said. The facts and the demand for them are inversely proportional. Nature abhors a vacuum. Reporters are nincompoops. I want you to repeat after me and all this. Reporters are? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, combine all of that. The, I'm, I'm jumping out of order here, but why not? Um, let's um, talk about what happens with early speculation. This is an oldie, but this is a classic. August of 1987. The location is Detroit, Michigan. This was a crash, a horrible crash. Uh, MD-82 on takeoff. Um, 156 people got killed. Um, uh, two of them were on the ground. There was one four-year-old girl who survived. You might, might remember or have heard her story. Uh, she grew up just fine. They just interviewed her recently. But anyway, I want you to, this is the clip that night. The reporter is Peter Van Sant. And literally, this, the, the hole is still smoldering, and this is what he put out there. Pratt & Whitney is the manufacturer of the engines which powered the Northwest jetliner. Pratt & Whitney today declined to speculate on what may have caused the crash. But the troubled past of some of their engines is one reason federal officials now are taking a hard look at them. Peter Van Sant has that part of the story. NTSB investigators at the accident scene are zeroing in on remnants of the DC-9's left engine after reports from some eyewitnesses who say it exploded moments before the crash. So, the report goes on to detail a series of airworthiness directives, service bulletins, etc., that were focused on this particular Pratt & Whitney engine. A half full way of looking at that same paper trail would be to say that's evidence that actually the system has some safety component built into it. That would be one way of looking at it. Uh, but regardless of that, uh, when the final report came in about a year later from the NTSB, it turns out that this particular crew missed a key point in their checklist, their pre-flight checklist, did not deploy the flaps or slats. And that is what caused that crash. And yet there is that demand to fill that hole with some kind of fact. And for, for you, uh, it is engineer week. I want engineers in here and people who are going to find their way in aviation career, careers to remember this, that we uh, in the media, um, with few exceptions, are, are not very good at sorting out these facts. And we need help. We need a little bit of help from you all to, to try to make this a little more accurate. Now, um, I, I gotta tell you a little bit also, there is kind of this macabre interest in, in aviation. Um, the aviation equivalent of a car chase is the gear up landing. You've seen a few of these, right? Uh, I cannot tell you how many of these I've done back in my CNN days. You know, the plane can't get the gear down, the choppers get dispatched, you've got the live picture, you're gonna see the whole thing unfold, who knows, maybe they'll get smeared all over the runway, whatever. But the granddaddy of all of these is um, JetBlue 292. This was a, an aircraft in uh, September 2005. Remember this one? The, the nose gear uh, deployed, but it was uh, cockeyed. It was, it was perpendicular. Let's just watch, though, the, the anchor's uh, attempt to, to um, dramatize this may have been a little over the top. Let's listen. Let's all take a second here, and let's all say a little prayer 
as this pilot touches down 139 people. 10 feet above the runway right now. 10 feet above. And now you see those main landing gear. This is it. Touching down. This and there is you can see, now he holds that nose it's up. Scary. He holds it up yeah. as much as he can now, and we'll see what happens here. He'll hit the landing gear, and he's holding it steady right now. So we'll far, see. so good. But there we go. And it's it. not snapping into place, but you can oh see that front uh, wheel is not on. It's not smoking right now, but the back wheel leaving a trail of smoke. Now the front wheel there, so it's yeah. grinding. He's got the air brakes on. A lot of sparks right now. Sparks yeah. flying. It's there. And you can see it's holding up a lot of uh, smoke and sparks now coming down. Fire trucks in trail right now. And it looks like he's going to have to take up the entire length yes. of the runway wow. here. Uh, but look at what this. What a great job. Now. It does not collapse. It he did it. He did it. He did it. So um, I don't want to misvise that. That was, that was a good landing. But this is an important little piece in television and aviation history. So far as we know, this is the first time that passengers were watching their own potential crash unfold <laughs> in their seat pack monitors, which JetBlue provided live coverage. So, I'm sure there were TV executives wondering if they could figure out how to get a Nielsen diary in their hands or something. I have lost track of, as I told you, how many gear up landings I've done. I will tell you this, they are all the same. And so I'm gonna give you just two of them at once, just so you can hear how they're all the same. <laughs> And uh, just like we would have predicted, and uh, that's, that's a wise thing. She got it in. You don't want to cause additional damage to the, uh, the, 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 the propellers, the engine, the engine mounts, the wings. Okay, straight away, write it down. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold that nose up, hold that nose up, but don't sink your tail. You gotta be careful on that. And down he goes, and uh, that was pretty good. He's right on the center line. So. <laughs> like a script. I will tell you the one on the right there uh, with the CNN logo in there, uh, I had just gotten out of the shower. I did that entire one dripping wet with a towel on. I'm sorry, I just uh, thought I'd tell you how the sausage is made, just so you know. <laughs> Does that undermine my credibility in any way? <laughs> so um, it's, uh, it's difficult to get cooperation from the airlines for some reason, or the aviation industry in general. The media calls we say we want to do X, Y, Z, they hang up. Um, I was talking today as I did the uh, spectacular tour of this campus, and they have a wonderful simulator, uh, which I got a chance to do a, a quick uh, lick at. And <clears throat> I frequently over the years have asked uh, to get access to bring cameras into simulators to explain various aspects of aviation incidents. And uh, needless, <laughs> the airlines don't like that idea. Flight safety doesn't like that idea. And, um, and I guess there might be a good reason for that. And I'll show you this. This is um, a friend of mine who works for CNN. I'm going to assume he was instructed to do this by producers. But this was after one of those unfortunate events. Uh, actually, in this case, uh, the person survived. But it was a wheel well stowaway story. You know, these people who actually get up in the wheel well of airplanes. And every now and then, they actually live through it, which is pretty extraordinary. But uh, when you see this Gary Tuckman uh, live shot, which I've kind of truncated a little bit, you'll see, I think, why the airline's a little nervous about saying yes to us. He went out to, because they said no, he went out to a, the, the boneyard in Mojave and, and did this. Take a look. How hard is it to get inside a wheel well? Gary Tuckman shows us. Someone who wanted to get in the wheel well would get on the tire, one of the two tires. And we're told there's only really one place to sit where you could possibly, there's nothing stupider in the world to do, but this is where you can do it. <laughs> so actually, I think there is something stupider. You just did it, Gary. That was stupid, but that's, that's uh, why we have a problem. Um, so I know at this point, we've reached the point where you're, you're wondering when I'm going to get to the mother of all media cluster events relating to aviation. Do we know what particular event that is? Yes, we do. MH370. I, I know you know the details. Uh, 777, 239 people. It vanishes March 8th, uh, 2014. And uh, this was on CNN in the BT era. That's before Trump. And um, they were interested in another nonstop drama of some kind. And so they decided this was going to be it. And so uh, I was unfortunately a party to this, but we were on the, the air for literally months with probably three facts. And, um, 
but that's never stopped us, right? Again, <laughs> well, remember that abhor, you know, that abhors a vacuum, the facts, inversely proportional, all that stuff. Um, so, um, it, and I'll give you an idea. Of, I, at, at a certain point, I just had to be honest about it. I'll, sh I'll show you what I said. I just, I was kind of over it at this point. When you hear this new information, do you have confidence that they're confident? Well, you know, no. <laughs> <laughs> Honest answer, right? Um, when they finally released a report, and the Malaysians were very slow to do this after months and months and months, they basically confirmed the three facts which we have been batting around for months. And uh, this is what uh, Richard Quest shared with the CNN audience. It tells us, one, the plane took off. It tells us where it went, the direction, and tells us that it was missing. <laughs> so that's like the duh factor. That is report. the duh factor. And, so that what is, the and that is what we've got from this report. Duh, indeed. And it was, it was, pretty, uh, it was a pretty confusing story to sort out. <clears throat> uh, all kinds of competing theories. Uh, and uh, they started rolling in, and it got, uh, what well, got, frankly, all of us who were trying to analyze this thing a little bit uh, confused. I've got to tell you that this, this whole thing is so perplexing that I've left a lot of my thinking about the details of what happened before the airplane ended up at a point where just about everybody agrees was the end point for them, right. but not the end game. <laughs> the end game is a different thing. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. But anyway, we were all hoping for the end game, but uh, it wasn't over yet. Matter of fact, it's still not over, actually. But then, believe it or not, it even got weirder. If you can believe this, wait till you hear this one. All of a sudden, we're going in a very different direction, quite literally. In Kazakhstan. Now, we're specifically in Kazakhstan, it's hard to say. This data is not so precise. But in the area of a place called Baikonur, um, there's other airstrips that are nearby, a place called Kizilorda. Um, it's hard to really pin it down, but I think what it does say, if the BFO value is spoofed and the BTO value is not spoofed, you're winding up somewhere in Kazakhstan. This then begs the question, why would the Russian government want to hijack this plane? Well, that's a great question, and a lot of people ask us about this theory. <laughs> yeah, suffice to say, there wasn't a good answer, right? And Vladimir Putin hijacking the plane, taking it to Kazakhstan, may sound pretty crazy, uh, but I, you know, I'll see your KGB plot, and I'll raise you into the world of astrophysics. Well, it was something fully that we don't really understand. A lot of people have been asking about that, about black holes and on and on and on and all of these conspiracy theories. So uh, Noah says, what else can you think about? Black hole, Bermuda Triangle. And then Deji says, huh, just like the movie Lost. And of course, it's also, they're also referencing the Twilight Zone, which is a very similar plot. That's what people are saying. I know it's preposterous, but it, is it preposterous, you think, Mary? Well, it is a black hole, about, you know, a small black hole would suck in our entire universe. <laughs> Now, I've always loved Mary Schiavo. At that moment, she, she earned my undying love for life. That was just <laughs> perfect. Just perfect, you know? Instead, I mean, she probably wanted to reach through and grab Don Lemon and say, you must be kidding me. Um, while the, the, after a while, the MH370 uh, analysts started getting worried uh, about what we were saying and, and just who might be listening. Bill, I don't know what to believe. I've heard <laughs> just about everything. You can imagine, it's like somebody's uh, writing children's stories without any, any concern for this. <laughs> so what's the root of all this? Let's go back to my favorite commentator on CNN. Epic mystery coupled with a chaotic and incomplete release of information. And so, uh, and then throw in the 24 hour news cycle and you've got a lot of speculation in the mix. So I, would, I don't want to get too deep into speculation. At which point I got deep into speculation, by the way. <laughs> it is a living. <laughs> so implicit in my talk is that I'm much smarter than all those guys, right? I do, I do know a little bit about aviation, however. Um, I, uh, I'm a pilot, a former plane owner. Uh, I lost the plane in the divorce. Uh, I have a good attorney. It only cost me an arm. And... Um, <laughs> Both of my grandfathers were pilots. Uh, there's my uh, grandfather, Russell Riley. That's at 
Logan Field in 1935 with his Stinson ER Reliant. He was a wool trader and used the plane to go around and sell bags of wool. And I grew up, that's my father in the left seat, I grew up in uh, rented 172s in Cherokees and um, uh, kind of learned how to fly without being able to see it over the, you know, the instrument panel. <laughs> and it was interesting because when I, I took my instrument training later in life, uh, they put me under the foggles and everything, I just nailed it. And the guy said, have you done this before? I said, no. And then I thought about it, I said, actually, that's how I learned how to fly. All I could see, I could only see the gauges. Um, I was an instrument pilot way back when. Um, my son, there he is, he's, he's a little older now. He's uh, 26 and now in the Navy. Not flying, he's on a surface ship. Couldn't convince him to do that. And uh, I, meanwhile, am uh, learning how to refly with one arm. <clears throat> uh, it works out pretty well. I don't think anybody's going to go with me, but... <laughs> But that's okay. Um, just waiting to do the check ride, and um, I'll be flying alone. That's okay. Um, so I'm not smarter than the average reporter, but I do uh, make a point of doing my homework. Uh, I was a history major in college. Yeah, go figure. Uh, I avoided science like the plague. I took an internship at NBC in Washington, kind of stumbled into journalism, did a bunch of local news stints at various local markets. And then I heard that CNN was looking for a science correspondent. I thought, well, maybe if I show up in a lab coat, that will work. I arrived for what was a two-day interview. It, they had me go out and do a story. They had me read, um, you know, for the teleprompter, all the things you would expect. But there was also a written and oral exam on science. The, uh, the editor of CNN Science at the time was a former molecular biologist. She took this stuff pretty seriously. And uh, so I, I, I had been covering local news, chasing around fires and bodies in Boston. I had no clue what they were talking about. They were asking me about the ozone hole and climate change, and I'm thinking that had something to do with the thermostat. And <laughs> I had no idea. I just failed miserably. So I get to the end of this two-day gauntlet, <clears throat> and uh, the president of CNN, Bob Fernod, He's at his desk, his classic scene, he's kind of this Damon Runyon character. Doesn't even look up from his desk, he goes, well, he's looking at my folder. Obviously you don't know crap about science. <laughs> and I said, he didn't say crap, you know what he said. And, um, and so that was one of those moments, right? What do you do in that moment? I was so bagged, right? And uh, you either fold up your tent and leave or you, f you do the Hail Mary. And I did the Hail Mary and I said, that's exactly why you want to hire me. You don't need anybody who knows science. You don't know science, Bob Fernod. Your audience doesn't know science. I'm just not afraid of it. And you don't need anybody who knows a lot of science. You need somebody who's willing to learn it. And at that time, I thought that was a line of BS, but it's actually true. <laughs> I learned that by doing my job. Um, you know, you can plan your career and then something like that comes along. I think it's important, you know, to look at the options and the possibilities. Um, you know, as it turns out, <clears throat> CNN and its science unit, um, as spectacular as it was in the day, <clears throat> there's an important little detail in this, which you're gonna, uh, I'll give you the conclusion to later. Um, Ted Turner uh, is an altruistic man, I think we can all agree, cares a lot about the environment, science and technology, but he also, you know, he comes from a billboard family, and he was trying to make CNN into something that was profitable. And very early on in the game, this is early, you know, they started in 1980, it was like, it was 1980, AT&T came to him and said, would you be interested in doing uh, science reports, three stories a week and a weekly show? And Ted was like, you know, kind of lifted his eyebrow, and, and, and they they said they'd write a big check for several million dollars to do this. And he was like, well, we definitely want to do science and technology. And it was really interesting because, for, so for years and years, when I first got there, science stories always were followed almost immediately by an ad for AT&T. And producers had absolutely written in stone uh, rules never to cut the science piece because there was revenue attached to it. And it had to be a really big deal. And then they had to come and account for it with their bosses. And so science was institutionalized on CNN, part of mainstream coverage, mostly because AT&T wrote a check. And they didn't want to lose that, that revenue. Um, and that was 
fantastic, right? I mean, <clears throat> science kind of carried its own weight. Uh, producers had to run it. And I had a ton of fun. Uh, I got to um, do all kinds of fun things, uh, including eventually uh, got a, uh, the great opportunity in uh, October of 98 to co-anchor the um, launch of John Glenn on his second space flight, this one on the space shuttle, uh, with Walter Cronkite. Now that was, you know, what it wouldn't, you know, I got to ask him all the important questions like, would you like a little more cream in that, Mr. Cronkite? And, <laughs> and so that was, that was an incredible high point. Uh, and then, uh, you know, a low point, but an important journalistic point, uh, February of 2003, uh, the loss of Columbia uh, and her crew, which I um, covered for CNN uh, 16 hours straight that day, as a matter of fact. Uh, at, as, as Maj mentioned briefly, at the time of that accident, I had spent <clears throat> in excess of four years negotiating with NASA and the Russians, although I didn't really want to go with the Russians, but I made NASA think I wanted to go with the Russians, to fly in space to the International Space Station. And we had finally cut a deal. We were going to announce it uh, about a week after Columbia should have landed uh, safely. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, didn't came to come to be. Of course, in the grand scheme of that tragedy, that was a minor point, but uh, it's um, something that, um, uh, you know, maybe Elon Musk will come through for me. Who knows? Um, so um, then, you know, I, things were going well. I got to do things like fly on the vomit comet. And then December 4th, 2008, our day, which will live in infamy, they eliminated the science and technology unit at CNN. There were eight of us that got fired in one day. Um, what do we know about the Kardashians, right? Who needs them, right? Um, and so I, I was a little bit... You know, I, I couldn't believe what had happened. What does a guy do when he's 40-something, actually 50-something, gets fired? He grows a beard, right? Yeah. <laughs> I did do that. So I was, I was trying to figure out what happened uh, at CNN and um, follow the money, AT&T, right? <clears throat> As CNN became more successful, that AT&T sponsorship, that linkage between the stories and the spots went away. They didn't have to do that anymore. So suddenly, producers didn't have a mandate to run science. What happened to science? What do you think? They didn't air it. See, this, this room there, these newsrooms, um, are filled with humanities people. Oh, the humanities. History majors, English majors, poli-sci majors, classics. There's no engineers in this room. There's no scientists. Um, they're not only not interested, they're pretty hostile toward it. Uh, I remember, you know, in the old days, we used to have to take, we'd walk down our videotape as we'd finished the science story. We'd put it in the player for the final supervising producer. And I remember one day, I put in some story. It was something really uh, relatively obscure, like on buckyballs or something like that, really. But it was, you know, I, I enjoyed doing that stuff because it was stuff I was learning about every day. And the, the producer kind of looks at it and does this, and he goes, you know, he said, I, I know that's science, but that was actually interesting. <laughs> Telling moment there. Um, so I'm sitting there with a beard and, you know, drinking, day drinking, <laughs> watching CNN, and... Uh, there was not much on CNN that made me feel better. Watch this. I was just asking Chad, how can you get a volcano in Iceland? Isn't it too, when you think of, you think of a volcano, you think of like Hawaii, and words like that. You don't think of Iceland. You think it's too cold to have a volcano there. But no, there it is. Look at that. What, do you, what is this? That is, Go that take is, us through these pictures. That is a plume of ash coming out of the top of a volcano, going straight up. What's tens, that white stuff? Though? Tens that of thousands. That's just a cloud. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> can I just do one more? Can I do one more Rick Sanchez, just for fun? Here's one more. Here, uh, there you can see the line, and notice this big drop. <clears throat> Down here, we have this big drop. This is about a nine-meter drop. Nine-meter drop. Nine meter. What does that mean? It, well, it means that the ocean <laughs> waves are doing something, that we're seeing some changes. It's been going down, and look at that. We've got a big rise. And so we're going to get our expert in here, who's way smarter than you and me put together, yeah. uh, Dr. Kurt Frankel. And uh, Dr. Frankel, tell us a little bit. You know, we talk about how the tsunami waves will come in, or the water will pull back right. before we start to see. Yeah. Is this a sign of that? I think that's a sign of 
that, uh, I don't think you can translate that nine meters into necessarily any, any specific wave height that will hit Hawaii, so we need to be careful about that. Um, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean there'll be a nine, nine meters of, of runoff in, in, in Hawaii, but, but it's just showing that the, the tsunami impact did not meters, that place. By, by, by the way, nine meters in English is? Oh, uh, uh, about 27 feet. 27 feet, yeah, 30 so, feet. So we're seeing a 27... Why worry? Everything's going to be fine. I, so I'm reflecting on my career, continuing the day drinking, thinking back, this is me in Boston in the 80s. Uh, I showed this picture to my kids. They said, what's that thing in front of you where your fingers are? <laughs> I, said, I said, that's a typewriter. I said, what's a typewriter? I said, well, it was a computer without the TV. I, I, I didn't know what to say, right? Uh, anyway, I realized that I had, uh, in my privileged perch as the science te and technology correspondent for CNN, had witnessed all kinds of great advancements early on. I just was never smart enough to invest in them. Uh, which means I still have to work for a living. Uh, but I realized things had changed an awful lot. This was the computer we used at uh, CNN uh, when I first got there. The VT100 went up to the VT101 and 102 before they quit. They, they, they were a color, green. <laughs> this, this was state-of-the-art editing in the 80s. Each of those machines there, 100 pounds each, tens of thousands of dollars, you have way more capability with iMovie on your Mac. Um, things were changing. So how did that all happen? Well, I, I want to pick a few key dates along the way. July 4th, 1997. Do you remember Pathfinder? That was like the first Mars mission we did in a long time. I mean, really since Viking days. So it had been a while. We, we come to, uh, back to Mars. We land beach ball style. And um, we had this little rover sojourner, and they, everybody named the rocks, and it was cute. But um, what was really interesting about this particular event is this was the first NASA mission of the Internet age. And as the images were released to the scientists, they were released to the public simultaneously. I, I don't know of any, that's, that's a critical change in, in history. When has that ever happened? Uh, it's kind of a democratization of science. They got, at the time, 97, remember, 265 million hits, which I think inflation adjusted is about a trillion or something. Um, and so that was a big moment. All of a sudden, access to information subtly shifting in, a, in an interesting way. People weren't waiting for the news anymore. A few months later, um, this is a date you probably won't remember, but um, this is an important internet news date. And I'll, I'll give you one little clue. Does, that, does anybody know what this is? Does anybody know? If you know, say so. Matt Drudge broke an important story. Ah, you know this story, huh? So it's really an interesting story here. Uh, Drudge, actually what happened was the Pope was going to Cuba. And Newsweek, had prepared this fantastic cover story on the Pope in Cuba. And they get this story about Monica Lewinsky across the desk, and uh, they say, hey, we'll just do that next week. Because we got this really great Pope thing going. And uh, somebody in the newsroom leaks some stuff to Drudge, and Drudge wrote a report saying, basically, Newsweek has this bombshell, and they're not publishing it. Well, all of a sudden, the, the complete, the system was gone at, at, that we had known. The gatekeepers were gone, and uh, news uh, release, news coverage, uh, was no longer in the control of just a handful of people, those humanities people in the newsrooms. Um, and meanwhile, the technology was getting uh, cheaper and smaller. I told you about that, you know, iMovie thing. Uh, on the 20th of July, 2001, I, I carried this little thing. At the time, we called it a... Um, uh, video phone. Uh, this is, you know, it seems quaint right now, but this was a big deal. We could take that little box, plug a camera into it from anywhere in the world, and, and do a live shot. I went up to Devon Island, which is uh, way, way high above the Arctic Circle in Canada, and uh, there was a group of people up there who were simulating Mars, because it kind of looks like Mars. And, and we did, we, it's really kind of clunky, but this was actually a big deal. No one was even certain we could reach the satellite, and there we were doing a live shot. This is a crew swap out day today. A group that has been in there for almost two weeks now will come out. A new crew will come in. 
These people are attempting to live life as if they were on Mars, living inside the close confines of that habitat, and whenever they venture outside, wearing spacesuits. So that was, the technology is changing, the access to information is changing, uh, and this started to speed up, like, much like Moore's Law. So let's go fast forward now to um, May 26, 2008. This is uh, the arrival of the Mars Phoenix, JPL again. And uh, the head of the newsroom there is an old friend of mine from CNN days. Her name is Veronica McGregor. And she, uh, this was uh, Memorial Day weekend. And she was a little worried about staffing uh, for this event. And so um, she wasn't sure how to get information out about the landing of, of Mars Phoenix. So her kids said, hey, why don't you try this new Twitter thing? And so her first tweets began uh, right be you know, weeks before the landing, and she, she ma made the brilliant decision to tweet in the first person as if she was the spacecraft. So reading from the bottom up, atmospheric entry has started. Time to get really nervous. Now I'm in the seven minutes of terror. Peak heating will hit in 40 seconds. The heat energy generated during atmospheric entry would be enough to power 280,000 homes. Parachute must open next. My signal's still getting to Earth, which is awesome. Uh, come on, rockets. I've landed. Cheers, tears, I'm here. Uh, people were eating it up. Now, um, at the time, these were epic numbers. She had 38,000 followers. I know that sounds silly now, but that was, no one was on Twitter. Today, you know, I think, Justin Bieber has about 45 million. Uh, but that, those tweets connected with people in ways that really struck her. Uh, she realized she could completely bypass the likes of me. Uh, all of a sudden, the press releases they've been doing for years, the news conferences seemed like they might be going out the window. And what was most interesting to her is she felt uh, if she was going to do this, uh, the Twitter thing, she felt like she would be sort of preaching to the choir. Uh, but that wasn't the case. Listen to her. This was really amazing for me because when we started this account, I expected to have maybe a couple hundred people sign up, people who were really interested in NASA missions, sort of the audience that was already sold on NASA missions and really followed them on a, on a daily basis. And what ended up happening is we had this enormous following from public, many of whom wrote and said they had never followed a NASA mission before, they had thought they'd never be interested in following a NASA mission before, but by getting these little tiny updates day, day by day of what the mission was doing, they were fascinated by it. So um, all of a sudden she had a new way to communicate, and that was seemingly going to be great. Uh, other missions followed, the rovers on Mars are tweeting, Cassini tweets, everybody tweets. Uh, tweet ups for NASA, uh, and they, you know, frankly, they don't need a smoldering hole in the ground. They have an ongoing dialogue with an audience that is very engaged with them. The press releases are pretty much a way of history. Uh, the news conferences, we don't gather like we used to as members of the media. Um, and it's a proof that, that kind of, you know, niche audiences uh, rule. And uh, in the world of social networking, if you do it right, a niche audience can become a big audience. Uh, a year later, this was um, an interesting moment as well. Ashton Kutcher, you know who he is? You know, at the time, he was Mr. Demi Moore. And he was, uh, believe it or not, in a race with CNN to become the first million follower Twitterer. Tweeter. Twitterer or Twitter? You, you, you pick. And um, so he, uh, he decided he thought that was kind of funny. And so he did this. He put this out of the web. CNN is at 897,969 followers. So I currently only have like 50,000 less followers than CNN, <laughs> which kind of makes me laugh. Um, but uh, that's just crazy. You know, if I, if I beat CNN to a million followers, I will literally go and ding-dong ditch Ted Turner's house while I'm in Atlanta. I'm going to be in Atlanta shooting my movie, and while I'm there, if I beat CNN to a million followers, I will ding-dong ditch Ted Turner's house, and I will video it and post the video of me ding-dong ditching Ted Turner's house. So meanwhile, at CNN, they're trying to figure out what a ding-dong ditch is. <laughs> and the network responded. They brought out the big guns for this in a particularly tone-deaf way. 
Hey, Kutcher, I got your message. It's Larry King. Do I have to tell you who I am? Anyway, are you putting me on? Do you, do you, are you kidding? Do you think you can take on an entire network? Do you know how big we are? Do you know what CNN is? Kutcher, you're playing out of your field. You're in, you're in, the, you're in another time zone. This ain't gonna work. CNN will bury you. But we won't take any ads saying we bury Kutcher. What would be the big deal in that? But I'm proud to say that I'll participate in anything you want. You come on my show, I'll go on your Twitter or whatever it is you do. <laughs> well, you know how that went, right? Obviously, he won. I don't know if you ever ding dong ditched or what that is still to this date, but I think you ding dong and you run. Um, Kutcher is at 19 million. CNN is now at 38 million, just for the record. Uh, the barbarians are well inside the gate. Uh, the media world is not going to be the same. Uh, it's either the, uh, the most exciting revolution you can imagine or the decline and fall of Western civilization. I'm not sure which. Um, it's one or the other, though. Uh, so all this just furthered my depression, of course. So I, um, yeah, enough of him. So uh, there I was, my buddy Scott Perezinski. I ran into him at uh, Grand Central Terminal, just out of the blue, you know. And uh, while, when I got done shining his shoes, uh, I said, Scott, what are you up to? <laughs> He said, he said, you know, I, you know, this is a guy who saved the shuttle, uh, the space station, single-handedly. The, the, the solar arrays were kind of bunched up like bad blinds, and he's, he's tall, and he was able to reach out and, with the fully extended robot arm, he was able to fix the solar arrays. It would have been a big deal otherwise. Great guy. But he, had, um, he said he had gone to try to summit Everest the previous year. He gets up to the final base camp before your summit, and he blows out a disc. That's not a good place. Now, Scott Perezinski, you say, God, that sounds awful. He said, oh, no, there's plenty of ice up there. No problem. <laughs> this, is what, this is why you put this guy in space, right? So he told me about that. And he said, you know, I'd really like to go back. I, like, you know, I can't afford it. And, and um, you know, I was, I was, you know, obviously I was shining shoes, so I could do it. And so I said, I thought about that little video phone, and I thought about the tweets, and I thought about Drudge, and I thought, well, wait a minute, there's got to be a way to do this, get somebody to sponsor it, and have somebody, you know, bring one of those little boxes with you, and um, we'll get a satellite phone, go up there, share your experience, we'll get some sponsors, we'll get some kids enthused about, you know, STEM, and mountaineering and adventuring and all the things that you are all about. You know, he's, he's perfect for all this stuff. So sure enough, I got one of these satellite phones, upgraded version, and gave it to him, taught him how to use it. And uh, I was supposed to go uh, along with him to base camp, but I got busy with another project and unfortunately had to sit in my laundry room the whole time and uh, anchor out of my laundry room coverage of Scott Perezinski summiting Everest. And, and stuff went like this. And uh, you can see, just ginormous uh, peaks all around us. Um, Pumori is over, over my, uh, my right shoulder here, but the mountain of our desires is Mount Everest, which is uh, kind of behind me now. That's just the shoulder of Mount Everest. The actual summit is about a mile higher than what you can see, believe, that, believe it or not. Wow, if, if that's the shoulder of the mountain, that is a big bone mountain, isn't it? <laughs> well, so it was kind of, you know, kind of clunky, but live from base camp, and we got, we, this got piped into classrooms, and we had kids asking questions, and it was like, wow, there's, there's something here. I mean, the distribution is so flat, the cost of entry is good, the, the, the internet is there, you know, what, what can go wrong with all this? I, I, so I decided, here I was, uh, no longer at CNN, I didn't want to miss any shuttle launches, so I, I called my buddy at Space Flight Now, Stephen Young, and I said, how hard would it be to plug a few cameras into the internet and do launch coverage? Uh, you know, six solid hours of shuttle launch coverage, no commercials, 500 miles deep, an inch wide coverage. And, and we did it. We did like five launches and we had 300,000 viewers, 160 countries, and they were asking us questions the whole time. It was very exciting. And so this idea of a niche player uh, thriving in this environment uh, was, was kind of heady for a time, uh, kind of the demassification of the media. 
Uh, every, everybody's a producer, everybody's an editor, everybody's a content provider. You know, what can go wrong with that? Uh, every, the problem is if everybody is talking, no one's listening, right? And I think that might be where we're headed right now. Um, doing my job today uh, is very different. Uh, we are closer to our audience. Uh, it is a dialogue. Uh, the story is told, enhanced, revamped. It's fact-checked by the masses uh, and trolls. And it, you end up in kind of this weird um, echo chamber. But in the early days, my friend Veronica McGregor was pretty sanguine about the possibility. She felt that ultimately it would be self-correcting. <laughs> Now, when I was doing the Mars Phoenix Twitter account, and as soon as I hit a certain number, I'd say, oh gosh, I think we got up to eight or 9,000 one day, and, and I had this little panic attack and thought, wow, if, if I put out anything that someone perceives as dishonest, hiding something, I'm not being transparent or honest about what is going on with this mission, I will be eaten alive by these followers. They will spread the word that we are not credible. So I find it, it's somewhat very reassuring that I know this is true and I think other people involved in media relations or PR also know that this is true. You cannot be dishonest. There are too many eyes looking at what you're saying and they will tear you apart and ruin your credibility if you try to put a spin that is not real on your story. I think that's debatable these days, right? Um, <laughs> it was a nice thought. Meanwhile, back in the land of mainstream media, that's the circulation of newspapers. That's, there's no news there for you, so to speak. Uh, circulation is down. These are the um, evening newscasts. Viewership is down. Uh, reporters who focus on science and technology. Uh, there's only a few papers left that even have a special uh, division that is focused on that, the New York Times being one of them. Obviously, CNN doesn't do it anymore. Uh, and so the, the mainstream media is... Um, not in the game like it used to be. Uh, the, the business model is not what it used to be. As much as anything, we, can, we owe this to things like Craigslist, which got rid of the, that huge revenue stream of classified ads. Uh, but there were a lot of missteps at the newspapers. When, when things got bad for the newspapers, what do they do? They fire their reporters. Well, you know, there's nothing to, nothing to print if you fire the reporters. So um, the, what, what has happened, of course, is uh, all of this can turn dark. And this is where we get into mainstream media devolving, we aided and embedded by Facebook, into crazy, malevolent, racist, ideological, sometimes state actors are involved, things that just are completely untrue. We used to call these things rumors, uh, but in uh, our discourse now, um, we call it fake news. The thing about rumors and in, in the old days, you know that famous Mark Twain expression, the, the, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth gets its boots on. That, that's a quaint notion now. It's so fast, it happens so quickly, it's almost impossible uh, to stay on top of it. And on top of the factual textual errors, technology, that same technology that gives you all the bells and whistles in iMovie, uh, make it possible for uh, visual trickery, shall we say. I don't know if you guys have seen this one, but let's watch this. Have you seen this one? All right, now that was pretty good editing, wasn't it? 
I, I still, I've looked at it a million times. I can't see where he did the edit. But of course, that is a model aircraft that lost the wing. I still get emails from people saying, have you seen this? Why isn't this on the TV? Can you believe it? It's fake. Or this one. This is, I, I kind of didn't cut this with a lot of preamble, but watch the wingtip on this plane, uh, ostensibly hit by a drone. Here we go. Pretty good, right? So if you, look, if you look really closely at it, it has the logo for the company that does the special effects on the whole thing, on the, on the tip of the wing there. So no, the drone did not hit a Southwest 737. Again, I get that email. Why isn't this on? This is scary. But then again, let's go back to our friends in the mainstream media. It's a good thing we have them, I think. This is November 30th, 2002. Chicago is the place. WGN is the, the distribution channel. Morning news anchors, Larry Potash and Robin Baumgarten, were Gardner, were doing their usual shtick. And watch what unfolded. There's some breaking news. We got a plane crash, 29th and King Drive. Let's go to Skycam. It, it, Skycam is cutting in and out, but it's supposedly in the middle of the road on the south side there at 29th and King. And wow. See a, oh, it looks like a giant hole in the middle of the street. Uh, we are, are just getting me? word that this is being uh, shot for, as part of a TV show. <laughs> they might want to tell the news folks when they're doing this and shutting down King Drive. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> we really get what we deserve, don't we? I mean, really, for some reason, people don't trust us. I don't know why. Uh, the cake, however, is probably taken by what you're about to see. Let me set this up. San Francisco is the station. KTVU is the, is the uh, particular place. Uh, they were covering the aftermath of an event in July of 2013. It was a, a crash of Asiana Flight 214. Now, this is a South Korean-based airline. While the anchor was on the air, uh, a producer took a phone call ostensibly from the NTSB, or so they thought, with the names of the flight crew. Listen. Coroner is still trying to determine the cause of death and whether she was already dead when the truck hit her. We have new information now also on the plane crash. KTVU has just learned the names of the four pilots who were on board the flight. They are Captain Sum Ting Wong, Lee Chun Lo, Ho Li Fook, and Bang Ding Ao. And the NTSB has confirmed these are the names of the pilots on board flight 214. We are working to determine exactly what roles each of them played during the landing on Saturday. So there you have it. Yeah, so uh, now I, I got to tell you, I, I, at CNN, there were many times, many times when I read teleprompter copy cold, having not seen it. And that's what happened to her. So it, believe it or not, she was the only person not fired in that transaction. <laughs> Turns out there was a, there was, had an intern at the NTSB, thought it'd be funny. He had the right phone numbers, called up, you know, nobody called back to double check. And next thing you know, that gets on the air, and it, you know they, they, everybody's fired. There's apologies to the Korean community. It goes on and on and on. <laughs> Orville and Wilbur could relate to that one. There's no question about it. Uh, fake news has always been with us, people. We have called it a lot of things. We call it fake news now. Uh, the important thing is we need to stay smart and make sure that we understand what we're seeing, how we're seeing it. And then we're doing our own personal fact checking because there's nobody else out there, obviously, who's doing it, including the media. Um, so um, don't just, you know, if you see the plane with the wing off, actually sending me an email is okay because I'll tell you it's, that's BS, but just to share it on Facebook and say, holy cow, uh, or things that make you angry and just sharing things without checking them out, it really exacerbates a bad problem in this country. I, I hate to leave it on a real scholarly note, but. I, James Madison said, knowledge will forever govern ignorance. And the people who rem, uh, mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge, knowledge gives. It's our responsibility. These are tools that we can use to engage in a meaningful way in our discourse. 
uh, and it's all how we use them. Uh, we need to demand for more from the media, likes of me, for sure. Uh, but we shouldn't be vow. We should vow all of us here not to feed on stu stupidity and anger, and things that are too good to be true. Because usually, as your mother said, that is the case. Anyway, I'm here for a while. I'd be happy to take your questions. Mark's going to come up and facilitate that. Thank you very much for listening. Over here. Over here. How do you follow that? <laughs> We're going to take questions because of the length of the program. We're going to take questions from students very quickly. So if you want to line up to either microphone, we're going to go to you very quickly. I got to ask you something. What's the life expectancy of an assignment editor or a news director who would allow some of this stuff to actually happen? <laughs> I, I'm not sure they got out of the building very quickly. They were probably summarily ushered out. Isn't that amazing? It's just, yeah. The, the fact that um, somebody told me very early on in my career, no matter what you write for TV, always read it out loud. It's a simple yeah. little thing. Uh, again, the anchors are frequently, when you're stuck on a set, th these things do happen, but it's incumbent upon people in the newsroom to say, because if you had read that out loud, presumably, you might go, holy fook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something <laughs> wrong here. <laughs> I'm just glad it was that and not something else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, other, the first rule of journalism is, is it true? Right? Right. And so they didn't vet these, some of these things before they go on, and I'm having to think, with the advent of all of these people who can use their phones and do stories and put stuff up on the internet with no censor, no vetting, what's the future for journalists who want to be serious journalists? How tough is it going to be for them to maintain positions when you can have these make-believe journalists out it's, there? It's very difficult. I'd like to think that people would um, flock to people who make it their job to check these things out. But I'm not sure that's what people are interested in anymore. They're interested in being... Uh, titillated, they're interested in having th their, their worldview reinforced in many cases. They may not be, you know, you can't handle the truth kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And so I think, I'm afraid that may be where we're headed in, in, in many respects. And I just would encourage everybody out there who uses this tool, this wonderful tool of social networking, it does have tremendous upside to it, as I, as I mentioned, uh, just to stop and think about the, the consequences of sharing things we either know not to be true or Boy, that sounds a little bad, but that's really a juicy one. I'm going to share it. Because it really does, it's, it's, it's broken down a lot of the, um, uh, the fabric that, that, that binds us together, I think. Well, firing and rehiring with CNN, your tragic accident, but now you're independent, you're still producing great stories, you're working with Nova, you're working with PBS and CNN. You seem happier now than those days we were watching you consistently with CNN. Do you I, feel happy? Absolutely. I, I have, you know, it's no fun getting fired. Uh, nobody likes to get fired, but if, if I hadn't been, I'd probably still be at CNN and I'd be pretty darn miserable right now because I, I don't know if you've seen a lot of CNN these days, but it's, uh, it's not very watchable from where I sit. Um, uh, you know, it's the eight person panel on the latest tweet. And uh, that's kind of what it's devolved to. And so, uh, it was really, a, you know, um, as, as stunning as it is to be fired that way, uh, it's been fantastic. I'm doing what I love. Thank God for PBS. Please remember us at Pledge Week. We'll, get, we'll send you a tote bag, I promise. <laughs> we, we really, I, honestly, if you think about, I, I, who, do you mind show of hands who watches the PBS NewsHour? Excellent. I'm so glad to see that. That you know, that, uh, of course, that's those are the people yeah. who might turn out to see me. But I, we, you know, we, if you look at it, the, the only reasonable, you know, television discourse is, is there. Uh, I, I don't see any other network uh, broadcasts that come close to it. And I'm not saying that just because I work for them. I just think that uh, they, they're almost uh, an anachronism these days. But um, you know, we try to try to offer up more facets and a little more diet than just the tweet. We're going to interspurt questions from the audience. If you would step to the microphone, come to the microphone, give your field of study what year you are in Embry-Riddle, and we can get you on record. Good evening, and thanks for being with us. Good evening. Thank you. Um, I'm a Master of Science in Aeronautics student from Argentina, actually. Uh, it's a real honor. So uh, my question is, if my cell phone allows it, um, 
So each space program inspired the general public in its very own way, starting from the beginning with the Mercury program, going to the moon, the International Space Station, the, the Space Shuttle. Um, how do you feel the current space exploration efforts are inspiring people? And how are you seeing the future? What are your expectations on the future of the space program inspiring people? Thank you. Yeah, I got two words for you. Elon Musk, man. That, that stuff, uh, I mean, it, you, who, who saw Falcon Heavy? I mean, you're all here, right? You saw yeah. it, right? This is like uh, only the Saturn V topped it. I unfortunately missed the launch. I won't miss the next one. Um, but it's, it's truly exciting what one billionaire who's very focused can do. I think, um, frankly, the, the private enterprise, uh, at, at the rate we're going, are going to beat NASA to Mars. I really believe that at this point. Uh, NASA has grand plans to go to Mars, but there's, there's no budget. There's no leadership from either the White House or Congress to, to really go to Mars, to really, like Kennedy said, you know, we choose to go to Mars and do the other things because they are hot. Pretty good, Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> None of that. And so I really don't, I, I, see, I see very focused, and you know, I was watching the, um, the feed from Hawthorne, California, and looking at all those 20-somethings, just, you know, absolutely alive with energy. And it's easy to forget that it was 20-somethings that took us to the moon, you know? Uh, there's, there's the famous story of Steve Bales, the electrical engineer, who, as they were landing the lunar module, you know, um, Neil and Buzz are landing the lunar, he was getting all these alarms, 1201 alarms, and he, at 23 years old, was the individual, the single individual that made it possible for that landing to occur because he knew that alarm was going to be okay. I mean, that's a tremendous amount of responsibility, and it says so much about the youth of our country. And to see those young people as enthused as they were uh, after that launch, I thought, wow, this is their grandkids, and they're carrying the fire. So I am as optimistic as I ever have been. It's taken a little while that we've been through the desert, on a horse with no name, and it's been tough not having the shuttles. I miss the shuttle uh, desperately. I miss coming here and seeing those launches. But I think in the end, we're going to end up, um, it's going to take a little bit of time, but we're going to get there. Let me take you out of aviation and aerospace yeah. to ask you, where are you on reporting or stories that relate to rising sea levels? Well, you know, it's very interesting. I'm actually starting a, a, an eight-part uh, series on uh, Florida for a little... You know, so I, uh, I hope your real estate is okay, folks, but <laughs> yeah. it's... Miami, um, big yeah. problem. Well, I mean, Miami, you know, the, the, as you all, I don't have to school you in all this, but limestone is a problem, and uh, there's no way to build a seawall around Miami. And so it's, um, and it gets into the classic, you know, science versus the Chamber of Commerce type story, right? And so what they're doing is they're putting in pumps on Miami Beach, which are really kind of... <laughs> window dressing, to say the least, uh, when there's a really uh, more fundamental problem here. So yes, look forward to those stories on the news hour coming up. Yeah, if you go down to First Avenue in Miami, you see it. It's yeah. there, and they're putting the wall Blue up. Blue skies. Blue yeah. skies, right? Yeah. Let's come over here now, and good evening. Thank you for being with us. Your question, give us your name and your field of study. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a freshman. Uh, I'm in computer science or computer engineering in flight. Um, and I was wondering, are, are there any memorable news stories that you have? Uh, odd, ridiculous, maybe your favorite that just really stuck out during your career with CNN? Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it sounds weird to say it's your favorite story when you're talking about such an uh, epic tragedy. But covering Columbia uh, was, you know, uh, you know, there are people to, to this day who come up to me and say, thank you for what you did that day. That, 16 hours? Is that yeah, it was 16 saying? solid hours in the air, then, you know, on a uh, chartered flight to get to Houston the next day, and on it went. But, you know, I was, I, was, I was really privileged. Here I was, this, you know, the history major, became the science guy, I've always loved aviation. And CNN, back in its heyday, spent a ton of money teaching me about space. I, I covered it, and they let me do it any way I wanted to. And, um, and so that day, that February day in 2003, uh, I was perfectly prepared for that moment. And uh, there's nothing like being in that kind of, it's kind of, that 16 hours is like 16 minutes to me. It's kind of just, you know, the, the, the athletes talk about flow. I was in that flow. And then of course, you know, listen, who, who else can say Walter Cronkite was their co-anchor? I believe, I think I'm the only guy. And uh, so that, you know, the, both of my, I would put both of them uh, in the space realm as far as kind of highs and lows. Let's come over here and your question yeah. now for Miles. 
Hi, I'm, my name is Zach. I'm a junior in aerospace engineering. And my question is, how, how do you think the, um, how the media portrays the aircraft accidents, how do you think it affects federal aviation regulations? Uh, that, you know, federal aviation regulations are so slow to move, you know, compared to how the media reports on them. Um, you know, there have been, there, there are certain watershed accidents. We were talking earlier about the, the Buffalo, the Colgan air crash, for example. And that has had an absolute direct impact on what goes on here at Embry-Riddle and how pilots are trained and, and the regulations and whether they should be ATP or how many hours you need to get into a cockpit. And that, that as much as anything, was, was a media-driven event. Um, you know, and did the FAA push it? It really came out you know, from Congress, from these families going to Congress. So the push came in that direction. The FAA, if you look at the way it's handled the drone situation, uh, is pretty darn slow. We're, we're still, you know, line of sight flying, and, and, and many other nations have, have uh, loosened up the reins. So um, I think um, the, the, the rule, the federal rules process uh, is written to be slow for, for reasons, uh, but the FAA could be nim more nimble in some places, and UAVs, UAS, would be high on my list for that. I want to get a few more questions in. Your question now from Miles O'Brien. Uh, good evening, Miles. My name is Gavin Rice. I'm a sophomore in the uh, aeronautical science degree. And my question for you is, so tonight you mentioned how there's been a steady decline of viewership of, of news outlets. So particularly with my generation, you know, me as a college student, I don't even have a TV. I feel kind of disconnected from the original cable outlet. What can you say to my generation about how we should uh, get our news and feel inspired to stay up to date with it? It's not so easy, is it, right? No. <laughs> it really, it, it's a jungle out there. And, you know, my, my kids are in their mid-20s. They don't have cable. They don't, they don't watch evening. I mean, everything I just told you was like for old farts. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so basically it's a, it's a whole different world. You have tremendous power, ability to draw in data streams. You're, you're, like, you're like your own producer. You know, we used to wait for Walter Cronkite to come on. Whatever those producers said was news was news, and we watched it. You're out there doing your own producing. So it's incumbent upon all of us. We have a responsibility as citizens to know what our sources are. So if you see something in the realm of aviation that doesn't sound right, you're going to know about it because you're, you're in this business. Um, it, what's interesting to me is I see so many things that are wrong in areas I actually know something about. I must conclude that everything is wrong. So if you walk into the, with that skepticism on the assumption that what you're reading is wrong until proven otherwise, uh, you're going to be OK. If, you, if you're just you know, clicking Reddit and you know, liking and sharing, and wh where do you go typically? What do you, how do you do it? Do you do? Uh, well, typically, probably Facebook is a big thing. Yeah. Um, I try my best to tune in to some radio stations that I'm from back home. Um, but again, that, that doesn't tend to happen too often. But it tends to be Facebook or Twitter, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's you know, Facebook, of course, is they're tweaking their algorithm now, which actually makes it harder for mainstream media players to get in the news feed, which is an interesting twist. So you, you, you're going to get cat videos more and, and more what your, you know, your Aunt Martha is watching or whatever. So you, you just have to be careful about uh, kind of this crowd mentality that develops around so-called facts. And it's not that hard to take that one extra step before you share it. You know, I, I, does anybody use Snopes? Do you, do you, do you like, you know? Yeah. I mean, I know there are some people who say Snopes is fake too, but they're not. They really are. They're just a bunch of old journalists who fact check all these stories. Those are good places to go. Um, you know, I start out with, you know, frankly, I'm old fashioned. I, I still read the New York Times online. I read the Washington Post. I, I use that as a baseline. And then I, I go out, I listen to podcasts. I, I, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's very aviation specific, which I'm sure you're familiar with. But you have to forage on your own. And it really is, it's, um, it places more responsibility on all of us. That's, that's heady, but that's also scary. You mentioned the Times. The Times did a piece a week before last saying 10 years from now, print will be gone. Agree or disagree? Well, it's, I, when you say print, it's already gone. <laughs> I mean, it'll be all digital content. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I agree. Like the Seattle totally Post agree. Intelligentsia. Totally, yeah, totally agree. Absolutely. I don't, I don't read a paper paper anymore. Do you? I, I do. Gets ink on your hands. Yeah. <laughs> I'm one of those old guys yeah, you were talking about. It's kind of hard to turn the page with one arm. I just, you know, I use the, 
use the iPad. Only you <laughs> could get away with it. <laughs> so I got the iPad. Let's anyway, go over here, yeah. sir, if you could. Yeah. To the microphone and your question. Yes, uh, my name is Mr. Lewis. Uh, I'm trying to find out. I'm a, uh, uh, I actually just finished college. Uh, I'm getting ready to apply here at Emory-Riddle. And I'm trying to find out, yeah, your, your commercial pilot. Um, uh, if you're 60 years old, can you still take a course like that? I'm, I'm getting, I'm, you know, I'm getting old, but well, I, any development I had single here. engine land in high school at my, at 18 years old, Piper Cherokee, and I still, I'm, in, you know, interested. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to apply here at Emory Riddle. I'm, I live right in Norman Beach. So I, I, I would you give the guy out. a round of applause? He's really? 60 years yeah. old. <laughs> Good for you, sir. I'll tell you what. If, uh, we have uh, people. I'm, I'm, we give, have people. Give that I'll man just a finish, contract, will you? Like, this I just finished American Airlines Delta Reservation System, which is Sabre computer system, very hard. Like Apollo. So yeah. I'll tell American you what. Airline Delta. We have, we have folks who would be I, glad to I, talk with you. You're never, you're never too. Uh, the problem is, I, if you really want an airline job, they make you retire at 65. So you got a little, you got a narrow window yeah, there. Well, but, yeah. but Unless uh, you want to fly you know. for South African <laughs> Airlines or uh, Air Canada, huh? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to take another question here very quickly because we only have a few minutes. You did something on the Boston bomber, and uh, that was an incredible piece. The, tr the terrible tragedy there, that was aside from your science reporting. That gave you another opportunity to stretch again as a journalist? Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, that was uh, I, I did a film for Nova, and <clears throat> they came to me um, literally the day they, they found uh, Sarnayev in the boat. You, you remember the whole scenario, right? And have you seen the movie recently? It's not a bad movie either. And um, anyway, they, they called me up and they said, can we... Can we do an hour on how technology aided and abetted the, the police um, ability to track these guys down? And I, had, I didn't have a clue if the, if the technology had anything to do with it. I said, yes, I'll do it. And they said, um, can you do it in five weeks? And I said, sure, no problem. <laughs> I hung up and I went, oh, Jesus, what did I just do? <laughs> so we, we scrambled around and did this film on you know things like infrared technology on the helicopters, uh, how they can triangulate a cell phone. Uh, all of these things are kind of cool things that really weren't used <laughs> for the men, but, but it was things they could have employed. And so we basically went through some <laughs> facial recognition. Nah, it didn't work. <laughs> you know, there's all these great ideas, um, but we won an Emmy anyway, so that was good. And um, <laughs> fake news, I don't know, maybe a little embellishment. Maybe I was just like that guy, Frank Moore. It was a <laughs> navigator's basket underneath the helicopter. I don't know. You know? Wow. Yeah. We come right over here. Your question for Miles O'Brien. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Wilkley. I'm a, a mechanical engineering graduate student here at the university. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, uh, given the number of people I imagine that you know within NASA, within the spaceflight community, uh, is there the fear within that community that by the time SLS actually flies, its role will have been made redundant by commercial providers. For instance, especially with the uh, Falcon 9, uh, Falcon Heavy rather, just having recently flown. Yeah, in a word, yes. They're, they're, they're petrified about it. I mean, there's a lot of talk, uh, you know, the, the Trump administration is kind of floating the idea of deep sixing the space station early to free up some money, which I don't think is a great idea. We have so much sunk cost into that and we're, you know, if there's ever going to be a scientific payout, we can't be pulling the plug early. Um, besides, the Chinese will probably buy it from us if we were smart about it. Right? <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that there's real concern, you know, because even the SLS as it is laid out, and there's really no money for it, they're just kind of Peter to pay Paul on that thing. The launch rate on it is just not enough, you know, and it's just. You, you just look at it and you realize it's a compromise to the point of really it becomes, you know, a PowerPoint. And, um, which is a shame because I, you know, I'd love to see NASA just have an influx of, of cash to do it because it, it could do it. The best people are there. They really are. And uh, they're dying to go. They've been wanting to go for a couple of generations now. And um, so, uh, you know, all I can say is, when you have an opportunity to talk to your members of Congress, just remind them that, that NASA is important to you and it's worth spending a little bit of money on it. Uh, we spend $19 billion a year on NASA, 19 billion. We actually spend more on coffee than we do on NASA. So, you know, oh. if we can do Starbucks, how about some bucks for the stars, right? Well said. Yeah, right? You know, in a tip of the hat to Dr. Murmurani, this is National Engineers Week. 
from your standpoint as a journalist, don't you see the future as being extremely bright for future engineers, those in our audience? As oh, well? I just, I, this was such an inspiring day for me. Uh, it is, uh, it's so great to, you know, it's always good to be around young people, particularly when you get discouraged about, because they're going to save our sorry asses, old folks. You know that, right? Because <laughs> we've made a mess for them. We really have, but they're really sharp and they're good. And uh, in, in all honesty, I, I think, um, you know, Maj and I were talking, he was talking about how he feels this is kind of a golden age for engineering, and that finally people are fully understanding the value that engineers bring to society, that, you know, these, these bridges don't just spring up by, by accident, or these rockets don't fly by accident. And people like Elon Musk are really engaging young people in a way they haven't been since the space race days. So uh, I think it's great, I, and I, my only pitch on this is, and I, and I told Maj this today, I think it's really important for engineers and scientists to, if they can, to communicate the passion they have for what they do to a larger audience, one way or another. Whether it's just across the kitchen table to your neighbors, whether you're tweeting, blogging, whatever you're doing, share that enthusiasm. Because you know, every time I come to a place like this or I walk on a uh, NASA uh, Center, I run into people who are absolutely excited to get up in the morning, dashing to get into work to solve that next problem. It's really, it's, it's so much fun to be around people like that. They're not doing it for money, they're not doing it for fame, they're doing it because they just love it. And engineers, as problem solvers, need to share that passion and enthusiasm with a wider audience. I really believe that because if you look at, at the trend lines on you know, science funding in particular, it's all, it's all down, and there's a lot of skepticism about the, in particular, the science community because of a lot of debates over things like climate change. And it's very important that um, this community of science, scientists and engineers don't sit back and expect the money to keep flowing. It won't unless you're out there advocating. Exit question. Dream, job, assignment. Is there a science thing that you would love to do that hasn't come on the schedule yet? There are two things I, I almost did at CNN. One was go to Antarctica. I never got that trip. There was a lot of things that got in my way. I want to do that one. And of course, I think you know the other one. I would really still like to go to space and report from space. Maybe, maybe Elon will bring me a, a, a Christmas gift one year and send me up there. I don't know. But What do you think? Yeah. In space? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Round trip, though. Round trip. All right, very quickly, I want to thank, we had so many students that worked with us tonight to make this happen. Uh, Autumn, er Eric, Deanna, Lorraine, Natalie, Diego, forgive me for not doing all your last names, Zachary, Sundus, Bruno, and Hannah. Uh, Tony Petro, thank you for running everything once again. Bob Score for coming back to work with us, and David Massey. Let's tell folks what we're going to do in a week when we come back to this. This is different. Our first foray into medicine. Researcher Magazine Live will talk about something that's called hip dysplasia with a panel of experts who will be right here at Embry-Riddle. If you know anyone in medicine, if you are, are knowing somebody who's going to have children, this does afflict many, many children, but there is hope for the future. We'll talk with not only the researchers, but a parent who has a child that has used this process to heal hip dysplasia in one week here in the Embry-Riddle Speaker Series. Thank you, Dr. Marmorani. Thank you, Dr. Kane, for partnering on this and giving us the opportunity to talk with a great guest. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, Miles O'Brien. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all for coming. Have a pleasant, Thank pleasant you. evening. Thank you. Nice time.